Okay, welcome back to the channel everybody and today we're going to be talking about how to run ANOVA using R and this is going to be a series just like the regression series was and so today we'll start with the one-way ANOVA and the multiple comparisons and the post hoc tests that we do following a significant ANOVA result and then in the future videos we'll cover the two-way and three-way factorial ANOVA and as well as how you might handle unequal sample sizes. So today we'll go ahead and get started with the one-way ANOVA. And as always, what we're going to do is the first half of the video will be an applied section where I show you how to run the code. And then the second portion of the video will come back here and talk about how to interpret and report the results. Okay, so looking at our code, um, and as always, the code will be available on my GitHub page, and the link to that is in the description of the video and on my About section. And for those of you, real quick, that aren't familiar with GitHub, it sounds complicated and fancy if you're not uh, familiar with it, but it's really, really simple. You literally just click the link, and you can download any of my code and files. So don't let the fact that it's a GitHub page uh, discourage you. It's super, super simple, and I highly encourage you to check out that page so you can follow along. Okay, and so the first thing we're gonna do is we're just going to load our packages as always and do some basic stuff. Um, you won't need all of these packages for one-way ANOVA, but you will need them to follow completely along with the analyses for the rest of the ANOVA stuff. So might as well just go ahead and install and load them now. So we'll go ahead and run our packages. And then the data set that we're gonna load in, uh, I'm going to save it as DAT1. And what this data set is, is I will show you uh, what we have here is we have participants, um, we have two age groups, young and old, where the young is coded as one, the old is coded as two, and then when we have these participants were exposed to a task condition, and what I mean by that is they were exposed to some sort of like brain teaser-like activity, and then they were asked to do a memory task afterwards where they had to recall a bunch of words. So basically, again, we have two categorical variables. One is age and one is uh, task condition. And the task condition was basically there were five different uh, like brain teasers they could have done and they varied in terms of like complexity. And what the idea here was is that the, uh, the researchers thought that as the, the, the complexity or the cognitive load of this, this task that they did beforehand increased, they thought that that might positively predict the number of words they recalled. So basically, if, if you engaged in a brain teaser that was more complex, you might be able to re remember more words later. Um, and so that was basically what they were looking at. Uh, this data set came from a data set by David Howell, and uh, I've included a link on my GitHub page, and I'll also include one in the description. Um, David Howell authored a book called Statistical Methods for Psychology. Um, and it's it's a great book and again this data set is from his web page and I believe that it's based off of an actual study and he has the details on his web page so we're only going to be looking at the effect of condition upon recall for the one-way ANOVA so we're going to be looking at one categorical variable the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to set our uh, our categorical variables to be factors because as we see in our data set they're coded numerically so we want to make sure that R knows that these are factors so you'll do this for whatever your categorical variables are, and then we'll run this to check and make sure that um, they, they, are, they came out correctly. And as we can see, factor with two levels, young, old, factor with five levels for condition, one, two, three, four, five, so we're good to go. The next thing we wanna do is, you don't have to do this, but that's always a good starting point. I'm going to do a cross tabulation of condition and age, and what this is gonna show me is this shows me the number of people that are in each group. So this, hel this helps me determine whether or not we have a balanced design in our data set. And here we see that we do. Uh, we have 10 people that were in each age and condition group. And again, we're only looking at condition for this one. And so the first thing we might wanna do is we might wanna do an overall ANOVA visualization. And what I mean by that is I'll go ahead and run it. It'll be easier for me to explain. Um, what you would do to run this code is the first thing we're going to do is we're going to specify a box plot where we specify our uh, dependent variable tilde as a function of our x variable. So this is where your outcome measure goes, this is where your, uh, your categorical predictor goes, and then this is just labels for the x and y axis and the main title. Um, and then I'm actually going to be generating three box plots, so this is the first one, it's recall by condition, 
The second block spot we're going to look at that you'll see in a second is just uh, re recall over overall. So we're not looking at um, there's no tilde like recall tilde. Uh, you know, our categorical predictor. We're just looking at the overall box plot of our outcome measure. And we will go ahead and run this code so I can show you better. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to see basically, you know, just a visual representation of what the ANOVA is testing. And the ANOVA is testing, do we think that we can, that our null hypothesis that the population means of our outcome measure at each level of our, you know, of our categorical measure is consistent and could be basically conceived of as coming from one overall population with, you know, one single population mean, or do we think it's better represented as coming from different populations with different means? Um, and so this is what it would look like if we just view our data as, you know, like one collective sample of recall with ignoring condition. And this is what it looks like when we account for task conditions. So these are the recall scores. The word recall score is split up by task condition. And so as we can see, it definitely seems like we're probably going to have a significant effect for condition uh, because there is quite a bit of variation in recall as we proceed by condition. All right. And then we can also look at a, a plot of the means with a 95% confidence interval for those means. Um, I had forgotten one line of code that I had to pause real quick and add this before we look at this plot. We need this line that I have highlighted right here. Uh, and so what this is doing is this is using a function called the summary SE or the summary standard error function. And so the way you do this is you make an object. I call this AOV1 underscore summary. You can call it whatever you want. And then you do summary SE. This is where the name of your data frame goes. This is where your outcome measure goes, recall for us. This is where your one categorical predictor goes, which is condition for us. And then this is the confidence interval that we want for the, uh, the group means. And so you have to run this first before we can run the, uh, the plot I'm going to show you. So make sure that you run this and the uh, the code that's posted on github does have this line so that is updated I just didn't have it updated in this particular script so you run that you save that object as AOV1 underscore summary and then you can use ggplot and now you specify that object so whatever you called it you put that name here and you'd say okay on the x-axis we're gonna have condition on the y-axis we're gonna have recall so again whatever your, your predictor, whatever your outcome measure is, we want to color it by our categorical predictor. And then we're going to add an error bar for the standard error of the mean. And so for y min, y min, the minimum equals whatever the outcome measure is minus the confidence interval. The y maximum equals the outcome measure plus the confidence interval. And then this geom line adds a line that's going to connect our means. And then geom point adds, you know, points for our group means and then this adds the title so it'll make sense once I show you what it looks like and so what we have here is a plot of the group means right with their uh, with their 95 or sorry their 90 percent confidence intervals um, I need to change that to say 90 percent instead of 95 it's whatever you specify when you you know create the plot anyways we see for group one, this is the estimated uh, recall mean, or not the estimated, the sample recall mean, and then uh, group two, and then condition three, condition four, condition five. And as we can see, kind of like we saw from our box plots, uh, it does look like condition is probably gonna have a significant effect upon word recall. And so again, what that's saying, or what it would say if it's true is that the complexity of the task that you're exposed to beforehand, like the brain teaser, that does significantly impact uh, the number of words that you'll, you will remember later. And then we can get another box plot, so I'll run it and then explain what it is. And this is just uh, the same thing that we looked at with the box plots a few minutes ago, but just a prettier version. Uh, so again, we just have the box plots for recall score by condition. And the way you would do this is you would specify ggplot and then name your data frame and then your x your x variable your categorical variable your outcome measure you're going to color it by the condition as you can see in the plot you're going to fill it in by the condition and then this alpha equals 0 0.3 makes it transparent instead of like a solid color and then this adds the title 
Okay, and so now we're going to come back here and take a look at the descriptive statistics. And so you see this first line of code. We've already run this line of code beforehand, but we'll just put it in again. And again, this is creating that summary object where we are estimating our, uh, our group means on the outcome measure. So again, we specify our data frame, the outcome measure, the categorical variable, and then the confidence interval that we want for our estimate. And this time we'll actually uh, print it and take a look at what that did because before we just used it to plot. And so now as we see down here at the bottom, for each condition it shows the number of observations, it shows the mean recall, shows the standard deviation of recall, and then the standard error for that, for that mean estimate, and then the confidence interval. We can also take a look at the means and variances, so this time we won't take a look at the standard error or the confidence interval. Um, you probably would need to do both of these, right? You can pick or choose. And so the first thing we do is we aggregate recall by condition. So y tilde x, and then the name of our data frame, and then the mean function. And then we'll do the same thing for the variance. So aggregate our y variable, tilde our x variable, and then the name of the data frame, and then the variance function. And then I just change the names of the results we get to say variance and mean, so we know what we're looking at. And then I'm going to join those two objects together. And you don't really need to know or worry too much about what I'm saying, right? You can just highlight this all, run it at once. And then what we're going to do is I'm also going to round it right here. And now we'll take a look at it. And then this is what it did, basically. So now by condition, we have the group means and the group variances. And so the reason this is important is because one of our assumptions about ANOVA, like we'll talk about later, is that we have homogeneity of variance, or our variance is uh, constant, our error variance is constant across groups. And if we look at our variance, uh, that does not seem to be the case. And then we could also get a slightly prettier version of the same thing. And here we go. Okay, so now let's go ahead and actually run the ANOVA. We've taken a look at the plots and we've taken a look at the uh, visuals. So we'll go ahead and make the AOV object. This is kind of like in the regression example where we make a regression model. This is just us making an object, so you can call this whatever you want. I called it AOV1. Then we're going to run AOV, and then this is where your outcome measure goes, tilde, whatever your categorical predictor is, and then the data equals whatever your data frame is. So let's go ahead and fit that. And then we need to do one more step. Um, a quick side note, uh, some people watching this video might you know, wonder why I'm specifying this type equals three. Well, this is the type three sums of squares. Okay, you don't strictly need to do this when you have equal sample sizes. Um, and you, you really don't even need to do it, period, when you have a one-way ANOVA, but you will need to do it later. And I find that it's easier for me to just keep the steps the same, right? It's not going to hurt anything to do exactly like I had this type tier. But I just wanted to make a side note and note that some of what you see here isn't strictly necessary, but it's not going to hurt anything. You will get the same results. And it's, I think it's good practice because you will need to do this for some more complex situations. So anyways, this is where we save the object up here. And then this is where we create a fit object. And it will make more sense in a second. Let me go ahead and run that. And so now we just, uh, we just print the results of this object, fit one. And so here's the results of our one-way ANOVA. And so ignore the intercept, right? We're focusing just on the, the predictors that we've entered in. So ignoring the intercept again, we show, it shows that uh, our condition effect is significant, okay? And we see that right here. This is the, the three asterisks, asterisks denote that this was a significant result. And we'll go over the interpretation uh, on the PowerPoint. We can also get eta squared, which is the uh, effect size. Um, you can also get partial eta squared by saying partial equals true instead. But I like just regular eta squared. And so all you do is you specify eda underscore squared and then the name of the object that you created above. So whatever you called it on this line, you then come down here and type that in. And then when we look at it, we have the estimate of eta squared and then the 90% confidence interval. And again, we'll go over the interpretation uh, in a few minutes. Another thing we can take a look at is we can fit this as a regression model. Uh, and this way, um, there's no need to do this, right? But it just, I just want to do it real quick so we can see that the results of a regression model are absolutely equivalent to an ANOVA. It's, this, it's basically the same thing. So we could just make a, a regression model, M1, 
and then it's a linear model of recall our outcome predicted by our categorical predictor condition and then the name of our data frame and I'll actually just specify that because that's a bad habit so we'll go ahead and run this we'll take a look at the summary and as we can see down here uh, when we do this it uses the uh, the, the dummy coding, right, where it compares it to a reference, right? So when we run the linear model just as it is with the factors, uh, what it's doing is just like before when we talked about the video with categorical predictors, these are the slopes, which are just the differences in our mean outcome measure for each of our categorical levels compared to whatever the reference is. So the reference for us is condition one. And so each of these estimates is the difference in mean uh, recall between condition two and condition one, condition three, condition one, condition four, condition one, condition five, condition one, etc. And so we can go ahead and compare the summary of our regression model to the differences and means that we uh, set up earlier when we made that AOV1 summary object. Again, this was the descriptive statistics we looked at earlier. And so if we take a look real quick, Okay, so this is the output of our regression model right here, and this is specifically, this is the estimated recall or the average recall for the condition one. And then if we look at the slope for condition two, a difference of 0 0.5. So basically condition two, they had a uh, estimated outcome uh, recall level that is 0 0.5 points higher than condition one. And sure enough, if we look at down here, if we look at for uh, condition one, the mean uh, recall estimate was 6.75, and then for level two, that was 7.25. Well, the difference between that is 0 0.5, and sure enough, that's what we have for our slope. And then the same thing for the rest of these. I won't go over all of them, but that's it's absolutely equivalent. And then we can also uh, get the semi-partial, um, the semi-partial squared correlation coefficients for this regression model. And so what we need to do is we need to first create this fit LM object. So again, we're just doing ANOVA and then the name of our regression model. The type equals three sums of squares. And just like before, this part isn't strictly necessary, but I would recommend doing it. Um, it's just good practice for later situations. So we'll go ahead and do it. And then we just run ETA underscore squared, whatever the name of the object we just made was. And then sure enough, so this is our equivalent to our partial eta squared that we saw from the ANOVA, right? 0.57, that's the same estimate we had when we looked at the ANOVA partial eta squared, and it's absolutely equivalent to the semi-partial squared correlation co coefficient. So those are equivalent, um, and I just wanted to show you that, again, the ANOVA is just a regression model with a categorical predictor. Okay, so now that we have a significant overall effect of condition, well, what if we want to know whether or not these, these differences that we saw in our regression model, these individual group differences, what if we want to know whether those are significant, right? Now, in our regression model, this only shows you the comparison of each of the conditions to condition one. So like condition two to condition one, condition three to condition one, so on and so forth. And then when we printed out the, uh, the summary of our ANOVA model, so I'll go back up here and look at our summary that we looked at earlier. Again, this is just showing the overall effect of condition, but what if we want to know about all of the comparisons for our specific categorical levels? So what if we want to look at uh, condition five compared to condition four and see if there's a significant difference in the mean outcome measure or condition four and condition three, condition four, condition two, so on and so forth. In order to do that, we have to come down here and do what we call multiple comparisons. And the easiest way to do this is to use a function that is in the LSR package that we loaded earlier, and it's called post hoc pairwise t. And you specify the x isn't your, now this is important, the x is not your predictor, the x is whatever you called your ANOVA object. So for us, it's AOV1, and I'll scroll up and show you where we got that from. Again, that's where AOV1 is what we saved the ANOVA object as when we fit it. So if you do these post hoc tests, X is whatever you save your ANOVA, your ANOVA object as. We also use an adjustment method called the home adjustment method. And this is to correct for the fact that we're doing multiple t-tests. And so we're going to try and control for our type 1 error rate. 
Uh, you can also change the adjustment to be a method called the Bonferroni method by doing that. Uh, I prefer the home method. I'll go ahead and do that. And so now what we see here is this is showing the p-values for the individual t-tests. And it's not as hard to interpret as it looks. So what we see here is that group 1 versus group 2, no significant difference. There is a significant difference between 3 and 1, 4 and 1, and 5 and 1. This shows us that there's a significant difference between 2 and 3, 4 and 2, 5 and 2. But then once we get to the upper levels, um, 3 versus 4, that's not significant at the 0.05 level. 3 versus 5, not significant either. And then 4 versus 5, not significant. And again, a side note about uh, this kind of shows you the problems of using p-values as like, um, that the problem is rather of saying like something significant or not significant, right? We see how, how close this p-value is to 0.05 and below, but yet we are arbitrarily declaring it to be not significant. So that's just a shortfall of using p-values and significance testing in general. Um, this is why we also want to look at effect sizes, right? Uh, but anyways, I don't want to get on a tangent. And so uh, I'll go over these pairwise results a little bit more in depth later, but this is how we get all of our pairwise comparisons, our multiple comparisons. And then we also need to take a look at our model assumptions. So real quick, the assumptions that we make are that our errors are independent and they are distributed normally and they have constant variance within groups. And so if we take a look at this plot, you do plot and then the name of whatever your AOV, your ANOVA object is. So for us, that's AOV1. This ask equals false is optional. That just makes it so I don't have to like look at these one at a time. So when I run this, this is the first two and I'll go over how to interpret these later. And then hit the arrow. This is the second two. And again, in, in, in about two or three minutes, I will go over how to interpret these in the PowerPoint. And then we can also get the uh, histogram of our residuals. You need to create a resid, uh, an object called resid1 or whatever you want to call it. And basically you say residuals and then the name of your ANOVA object. So or your ANOVA model, right? So we're extracting the residuals and saving them as resid1 and then looking at a histogram of those. And we see that here. And it does look like they are distributed pretty normally around zero. Now, if your heterogeneity of variance is super strong, we can use the Welch test. And so this is a way that we, we actually looked at this earlier, but what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to look at the, the variances by level of our condition, because our assumption is that if we go back to our box plot, our assumption is we're saying that our variance within groups or within our levels of our factor is constant. And as we can see, it doesn't look like it is, right? The spread for uh, condition five of, of our outcome measure recall is much greater than uh, condition one and two and so forth, right? But we can also run this code and this gives us uh, the, the variances, right? Um, this says recall right here, but it's actually the variance of recall. So don't let that confuse you, right? And so what we see is this is showing us the variance of recall for condition one, condition two, condition three, condition four, condition five. And as we can see, uh, there are some pretty, pretty severe discrepancies, especially like when we start looking at level five versus level two, uh, 24 versus 2.6. Uh, a general rule of thumb is a ratio of more than five is problematic. And if you have unequal sample sizes, then any type of heterogeneity or unequal error variance is, is gonna be problematic. But if you have equal sample sizes, like we do, where you have the same number of participants in each of your group categories, then uh, a ratio of usually greater than four or greater than four or five is considered fine. And so our ratio of our largest to smallest, what you do is you just take your largest, which for us is 24, and compare that to your smallest uh, sample variance, which is 2.6. Well, 24 divided by 2.6, that's a ratio of 9.3. So, or 9.23 rather. So we do, it does look like we have heterogeneity of variance. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the, whether or not, uh, again, like what, what types of cutoffs you can use. Some people use tests, like the Levine test to test whether or not you have homogeneity of variance. Uh, I don't like those tests because they are sensitive to sample size 
as one of my uh, professors mentioned when I used to use it. Um, so I just like to compare the variances directly like we just did and just do a simple ratio. So if you do have heterogeneity of variance, so in other words, if your variance is unequal across groups, we can use something called the Welch test, which is specified by oneway.test. And it's kind of like the Welch separate variance t-test, except for more than two groups or multiple groups. So you do your outcome, tilde, your, uh, your, your categorical predictor, and then the name of your data frame. So if we run that, we still get a significant result. So this is kind of good to see because it lets us know that, hey, even after we don't assume equal variances, we would still get a significant result. If your normality assumption is severely violated, you can use a, a, a non-parametric test called the Kruskal-Wallis test. And again, our assumption is that our errors are normally distributed um, and also that we have a normal distribution specifically of the variance within groups. So, um, uh, sorry, not a normal distribution of the variance, a normal distribution of our errors within groups. And so, again, we're looking to see at each level of condition, do we have a normal distribution of our outcome measure or um, so on and so forth. And it looks like we, we, we do because, again, these box plots all appear to have a relatively normal shape. But if you didn't have that, then you could run this this Kruskal test, this Kruskal Wallace test, and you would do your outcome measure, tilde, your categorical predictor, and then the name of your data set. And sure enough, uh, this is a, again, like I said, a non-parametric rank sum test, which you don't need to worry about for right now. But even when we do that, we still get a significant result. So this is how we can, uh, you know, use an alternative that doesn't assume equal variances across groups. And this is how we can do a non-parametric alternative that doesn't assume normality within groups. And now we will go to the PowerPoint and talk about how to interpret and write up these results. Okay, and this is just an overview of what we're essentially trying to look at. Our research problem, does word recall vary by task complexity? If you're exposed to a more complex task, um, like a brain teaser, will that help you remember more words later? And this is just the mean of recall by group and then the variance. Um, and then these are the box plots we looked at earlier. Okay, so these are the results. And where I got this particular uh, table from is just what we did in R, right? This is the summary of our, uh, our ANOVA model that we looked at. And then this is the ETA squared that we looked at when we did the effect sizes. So all of this came from the code we just ran. And again, as we discussed, we do have, uh, it does appear that condition has a significant effect upon word recall. And then the ETA squared is 0.57. And this is just when we have a one-way ANOVA, this is just the proportion of, of variance, right? Um, Specifically, 57% of the variation in word recall was explained by condition. And then this in the brackets, that's the confidence interval, the 90% confidence interval uh, for the ETA squared. So again, the ETA squared for the one-way ANOVA is the percentage of the variation in our outcome measure word recall that's explained by our categorical predictor. And this is just the plot we looked at earlier with the means and the error bars. Okay. So this is how we might do a fancy write-up. Um, regardless of whether or not you care about the write-up down here at the bottom, this table is always really powerful. I highly recommend you do the table we just looked at and then this table as well. And so what this table is looking at is it's comparing the, it's a way of visualizing the comparisons of the individual, um, like uh, pairwise comparisons, right? And so specifically, this is the mean outcome level or recall in our case by each level of condition, and these superscripts, these letters, these represent whether or not these comparisons uh, are significant or not, right? And this is the post hoc comparisons that we did earlier. And so the way you interpret this is if two groups have the same letter superscript, they are not significantly different than one another. So group one and group two did not have significantly different recall levels. But if, they, uh, if we come down here, if they have different letters, then they are significantly different. And so three, four, and five, they did not differ significantly from one another, but three, four, and five were all significantly different than both uh, condition two and condition one. So again, one and two did not have significantly different recall levels. Three, four, and five did not have significantly different recall levels, but three, four, and five 
all had significantly different levels than both the, the recall of the folks in condition two and in condition one. So that's how you interpret that. And then you just make a note at the bottom of your table. It says mean sharing a superscript do not differ significantly at the home adjusted 0.05 level. Uh, and again, that's because we used a adjustment to control for doing multiple tests. It's also a good idea to state the number of uh, participants in each condition. Um, and so we had 20 in each and then the standard deviation as well. And so the way we would write up our results in APA format if we wanted to is we would say study participants word recall scores were significantly related to the cognitive complexity of the tasks they engaged in beforehand. Then F followed by our degrees of freedom and again that's in our ANOVA summary that's where we got this from. So the F on 495 degrees of freedom equals 31.21. You state your mean square error which if we go back. This is our mean square error right here, this 12.10. Um, and then this is where we got our degrees of freedom again from, and then our F value. So uh, we state again, F on 495 degrees of freedom equals 31.21, mean square error equals blah, blah, blah. And then this was the P value. And this is the eta squared. That's what that uh, funny looking symbol means. And then the confidence interval for eta squared. So this is just one concise sentence that basically just says, yes, uh, word recall, our outcome measure was significantly related to our categorical predictor. So as shown in table one, mean number of words recalled was significantly less for participants who engaged in level one and two complexity tasks than the participants who engaged in level three, four, and five tasks. All other comparisons fell short of statistical significance. So that's just saying that, like we said, the people in one and two uh, they varied significantly on our outcome measure with uh, compared to conditions, those in conditions three, four, and five, but all of our other comparisons didn't have any significant differences. So one and two weren't significantly different from one another. Three, four, and five weren't significantly different from one another. So this is just a clear and concise way that you can summarize what we see in our table. And the last thing, again, this is our uh, regression diagnostics. And so what we're looking at in this first one is a plot of our fitted values. And again, fitted is just predicted values. Um, so we're looking at as we proceed, you know, across different levels of fitted values, which again, our fitted value, remember, is just the mean uh, outcome level that we expect for each group level. So as we proceed across our mean fitted values, this shows us the residuals, right? And so we're looking for is to make sure there's no pattern, right? This We want this red line to be flat, but we also want the spread to be consistent, right? And we can see that it's not, right? Our spread here is um, our variance, our air variance is not constant as we proceed. It gets wider, like a cone shape, right? As we proceed in our fitted values, our air variance starts to increase. So again, we talked about earlier, that uh, this would indicate that we do not have homogeneity of air variance. And so in that instance, um, we talked about some options we might have. And in, in, in our case, we could have done the Welch test. And as we saw, we still got significant results. And then if we look at uh, this QQ plot, this is showing us whether or not our residuals are distributed normally around a mean of zero. And ideally, we want them to fall perfectly flat on this line. That will never happen in real life. Uh, this is probably about as good as you'll ever get. And so this looks really good. And we also see this uh, another visualization of the same concept in our histogram. We're looking to see if our residuals are distributed normally around zero, and it does look like they are. So yeah, so even though it looks like our homogeneity of error variance uh, assumption might not be uh, the best in the world and might not be justified, um, we do have normality of our residuals. They are distributed normally around zero. And when we ran the test to account for separate variances, um, we still got the same result. And so that's it for this video, and we will proceed on to what we call factorial ANOVA in the next video, which is when we have two categorical predictors.